Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you all to please kindly remain seated. We are quickly moving on to the next session, which is Behtar Bajaj, Building the Digital Future of India, another special fireside chat. For this session, we have with us Mr. Sanjeev Bajaj, Chairman and Managing Director, Bajaj Finserve Limited. He is in conversation with Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, Chairman, Hero Enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming them with a huge round of applause. I request you all to please remain seated. Please remain in your seats. We are moving on to this special fireside chat. It gives me great honor to introduce Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal. Mr. Munjal, the chairman of Hero Enterprise, is a celebrated business leader, an institution builder, a social entrepreneur, an angel investor, and a thought leader. He sits on the boards of IIM Ahmedabad, ISB, SRCC, and University of Tokyo. He is also on the board of trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He has co-founded BML Munjal University and is president of Dayanand Medical College and Hospital Ludhiana. He has been a member of Prime Minister's Council on Trade and Industry and was on government task forces that prepared the ground for India's banking, financial services and taxation reforms. May I now request Mr. Munjal to kindly conduct the session. Thank you. Sanjeev, let me welcome you to this conversation. And I presume it's okay for you to make it a conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. So, you and I have a lot in common, if I think about it. We've both been involved in a two-wheeler business, and both our families, actually both our brothers run two-wheeler two businesses, which neither one of us does now. And both of us have played a role in CII, which, which has uh, been an interesting role. As you know, you are still on the, on the roller coaster right now, and I got off a while ago. Your your story, your own personal story, is a very fascinating one. Uh, not only are you from a renowned family, a super successful entrepreneur yourself, uh, leading many initiatives, both in business and non-business. Uh, you have been, in many ways, a transformative leader. The conversation today uh, was supposed to be, and I'm saying supposed to be, by the way, on on digital technologies, as especially as they apply to the financial services. But if you are okay with it, I'd like to make it a little bit more open, a little bit more personal. Um, and maybe the audience will, will find that also more interesting than only a conversation on technology, which we hear a lot of nowadays. Um, let me begin by asking you a little bit uh, about home. You, you know, since our families are well known uh, to each other, I've known your father and your brother uh, both uh, quite well. They were both pretty strong personalities. And I'm putting it mildly, by the way. And, and you, on the other hand, have this very quiet demeanor. I was trying to wonder if there was an argument on the dining table at home, and I'm sure there must have been every now and then, how would they actually get resolved? So Sunil, uh, it's good to be here. And as you said, we have more similarities than uh, many other uh, uh, people that we know. Um, and equally strong or mild personalities on both sides, uh, definitely very smart ones on both sides. Um, so the simple answer to your question is that when, when somebody takes the lead to talk, someone else has to take the lead to listen. And uh, being the younger brother, uh, having a father as uh, uh, aggressive as mine, you learn very quickly that it's better to first listen, let some of the steam blow off, and then present your point of view. And uh, I'm, of course, saying that partly jokingly, but partly that was my experience uh, with my father because for some of you who may have seen him on television uh, or otherwise at some of these events, 
Um, and he was always very vociferous. He had a strong point of view. He made sure that uh, his point of view got heard, got discussed. That was not for the stage. That is how he was 24 by 7. That's how he was at home. Growing up when we were kids, that is how he was. So in, so in many ways, we were used. Uh, we, we were used to him being like that. But I, but I always found of, of him that uh, once you gave him a few minutes and then presented your point of view, he actually heard it very seriously. And if you could present a point of view different from his, but logically, he very often accepted it and then supported you fully as well. So, so that was just his way. That was his personality. And we, we used to joke later on in his uh, later years uh, where uh, I used to tell him that because we both went to Harvard Business School, I used, I used to tell him that we both learned the same thing, that we can argue both sides of the issue. But you don't have to argue that every time at work. I also know that. And he started laughing. But that was him. So um, while on Harvard, I understand you worked really, really hard. <clears throat> and I don't know if this is accurate. I was told you went through some 700 case studies or some such. You were doing like two or three a day, every single day. Yes. So again, the, the joke over there was in my, you had four terms over two years. In my first term, you did three cases a day, Monday to Friday. So that's 15 cases uh, a week. Um, but a lot of students were complaining for the past few years that the case study was getting too heavy. And by the second term, they brought it down to alternate days of three and two cases. You did three, two, three, two, three, which also, if you total up with the first term, comes to about 650, 700 cases. So I remember coming back and uh, my uncle Neeraj also went to HBS and saying that, you know, what a large uh, workload we have. And he said, nonsense. He said, I did three cases a day and it was much tougher for me. And my father was sitting over there and he said, we did three cases a day and we had a submission every Saturday. So you guys have had it light. Um, I'm also told you were forced by your father, father to walk to school one day when he learned that you were using the family car. Is yeah. there a message you think, or is there a lesson for many who try and give the best to their children? What kind of learnings do you think are important, uh, especially in today's world, both material and highly uh, facilitating? So we grew up uh, on the factory campus outside of Pune, which is where the first Bajaj Auto factory came up. My father moved from Mumbai and uh, set up house in the colony. Um, most of our senior management stayed in the city, which is about 30 kilometers away. Their children went to the schools in the city. Um, but my father was very clear that if he was from Mumbai going to move to Pune, he wanted to be where the factory was. Um, and we had a colony where we had probably three, four hundred families, mostly middle, low, middle class over there. And there was a very good convent school that had started nearby. This, these, these were Swiss uh, missionaries. So it was a good quality school. But the student that went there came from middle class, low middle class families, our drivers, our security staff, uh, and those in the junior levels, not only in Bajaj Auto, but Thermax, SKF, Tata Motors, um, all those companies. My mother and father were both very clear that that's the school we must go to, uh, because that is the India that we live in. And, and they knew that the school was of good education, so they would not compromise on that. Um, and growing up, um, so I graduated with, I finished my 10th grade there, and it didn't have 11th and 12th at that time. So I went to college, junior college in the city. Um, and so we went on the school bus, uh, the school bus. And I remember, uh, so we used to walk from home to the school bus and with everybody else uh, go to school. One day, either my sister, Rajiv, me, one of us uh, got late. So my mother said, okay, we had this ambassador car. And she said, okay, the car will drop you. We said, okay, went uh, in the car uh, and came back. Um, the next day, must have been Rajiv or me because my sister was too scared of my parents. And this was all of maybe ages, you know, 8, 9, and 11. Uh, one of us must have said, let's do it again. So we did it again. So two, three days went like this. 
suddenly we were all feeling really happy. My sister was sheepishly, she's the youngest following us as well. And then the next day, when we got ready, instead of my mother being outside, my father was standing there. And he was always a late riser, so he normally was never there. So we were shocked. And he said, you will walk to school. So, uh, so we had one uh, staff member, and the walk was a 20-minute walk. It was not far at all. And what we were all scared of was the school had very high levels of discipline by the Swiss nuns. So we were scared of reaching the school after the bell had rung, the start bell. And that's what happened, and we got punished in school. Of course, we always made sure that we woke up in time after that. But um, the grounding that, that brought us and the people we hung around with. Uh, many of my friends are still from those school days, from the time that we were three years old. We still meet once a month at least for dinner. My children went to a similar school. We set up a second school then when the number of people, kids became very high. So they went through the same school as well. So clearly your, your childhood was as normal as could be or as should be. Uh, of course, we shall not talk about how you were watching lots of movies or, or uh, the basketball that you played or, or the long phone calls and you were making to your girlfriend who subsequently became your wife. Uh, let me come to, to a slightly more current period of time. You are not just, I've not seen this close up. You're an actual protagonist in the formalization of the Indian economy, especially the financial system. Uh, starting with the jolt that the entire economy got at the demonetization time and then watching the next big change take place uh, when the lockdown started in the COVID time. Uh, and you have right through this sailed through uh, being a little bit ahead of the curve. In a sense, you've almost drawn the map for the digital transformation that India is going through in the financial sector. Uh, not only have you built one of the leading companies in the business, you have built a company which is strong, powerful, a leader in the country. Tell us what were the, the learnings that you found in the early days of this transformation and how much would you have imagined at that time would be the impact of digitalization when you were starting off? So first I must mention, Sunil, from some of the things you mentioned earlier, you all have done your homework over here. Um, see, I spent 10 years in Bajaj Auto after I came back from HBS, from 97 to 2007. Around 2005 is when some of our large institutional investors in Bajaj Auto uh, told us that, you know, you guys have uh, invested in a set of financial services businesses that was all done through Bajaj Auto because that was the cash cow for the group. But over a period of time, you will have auto and financial services in one basket. And that's not necessarily what every investor wants because you have investors with, definite, with different uh, appetites and interests. And we went through the process of demerging out the financial services business in 2007-8. That's when I moved uh, from Bajaj Auto to start rebuilding financial services, which at that time was Bajaj Finance, a very small NBFC and our two insurance companies with Allianz of Germany. Um, the one thing that I knew was that I knew nothing about financial services. So I knew I needed a good team um, right away. Second, I was fortunate that uh, an uncle of mine, my mother's sister's husband called Nanu Pamnani, who was a career city banker. Actually, I was going to ask you about Nanu, but yeah. go ahead. So Nanu was our mentor. He had retired from Citibank just then, spending 40 years in Citibank. And my father requested him, saying that, will you help Sanjeev build these businesses? And he uh, uh, right away agreed. He used to be and he used to be in Bombay. Every Tuesday morning, he used to be in office driving from Mumbai. He used to be the first one there at 8.15. Meeting started at 8.30. We used to finish by 6. He used to drive back to Bombay. He helped put in place processes, the right discipline. He had the right experience. So, for example, Rajiv Jain, who came on board as the CEO, is still the CEO of the company. He and I had the freedom to go and build, chasing our dreams, chasing our ideas, that of our teams, because we knew Nanu was there. If we were pushing too far out, he could pull us back. The trio of us, I believe, in hindsight, ended up being that great combination where we were very clear that we were focused on building long-term businesses. 
we would give up short term opportunities if that came in the way of the kind of capabilities we wanted to build in the long term i was very clear that coming from a, a business family i had this um, freedom within a set of broad guidelines set by the board to go and build, build business as i felt appropriate to me it was very important to replicate that for the next 25 50 100 people in each of our companies you can't do that for 5000 people but so that they feel as much as owners which has to do with what is the level of empowerment that you give them the flexibility also how do you pay them how do you get them to focus long term so that they are aligned with shareholders long term shareholders as well so we we've tried to do that every time we are very clear that we are in the risk business and hence we will always choose risk over growth i think that is what has helped us put the best practices in place uh, over the last decade decade and a half which has helped us through these tough periods no it's actually quite fascinating from inheriting a financial services firm which was really only supporting motorcycle sales at at one point in time to building this behemoth of of uh, financial services it, it's is truly as i said uh, a journey worth noting um i want to pick on a comment you made once to janmay uh, janmay sinha of, of bcg in one of the meetings uh, you said if you were to send a man to mars you would lean on expertise from the west but if you were to have that person survive for long term on the mars you would look at knowledge and resources from the east why did you say this you see when we've built our businesses we've also looked at partnerships from around the world especially there is so much that's happening in the startup field there's so much innovation um, and ingenuity that we see there uh that we keep scouting for it and we've been doing this across the world both in the west and the east what we find with the west and of course I, i'm a little bit uh, coloring it all uh, at a level of exaggeration just to drive the point is the west ends up being very transactional so if you want to go and buy a product you want to buy a service in a very predefined clear manner it's very simple it's very open it's very transparent but if you're building something for the long term and this is based on long term relationships i think that tradition those values exist more in the east and uh, so th so that's why if you have a specific project that you want to go and do which is landing on mars do it in the west but if you have to live there more long term you have to think more long term we find that companies in the east culturally are more aligned now this could also be an issue of a point in time 50 years down the line it could be different um i understand last january you were threatened by a hacker apparently from russia uh to to uh to attack your system especially focused on on the data that you manage which is of course both large and valuable um how much of uh the time that your top team spends on business design do you worry about security given how digital each of our businesses has become and financial services has become um cyber security is one of the foremost risks on our mind it is a serious topic where uh, uh, it's it not only gets discussed at the board level but there are specific committees that address it as well our technology framework itself takes that into account so that we have handoffs between databases uh, so that an external hacker can only reach up to a particular level of information but end of the day you're still in such a interconnected world that when when somebody attacks you and says i have access to xyz data you need to make sure that they've not found a way through which the people who have designed the system tell you that can't happen uh, and in this case that's what it was it was just superficial access but i must say that between our financial services companies we get attacked over 100 times a day yeah yeah and and it's becoming more and more common so in the old days and i'm saying old i'm talking about when the use of internet in business was becoming more and more prevalent uh, people used to say i will stay cut off from the system 
Uh, today, the only way to do that is live as a hermit because it is all pervasive. Technology is becoming increasingly uh, a part of almost every aspect of our lives. So it is not no longer an option. So therefore, security concern, design of networks, and, and process uh, uh, identification as to who gets access, etc., has become uh, an increasingly important part of any system design. Um, the industry itself, the financial services industry has grown at 17% compounded now, year on year, every year for 10 years. Uh, and you've been, as I was saying earlier, uh, one of the clear leaders in the industry. The other interesting thing that's, ha that's happened at the same time is this digital access across India. The availability of a digital identity of every Indian through Aadhaar, the availability of digital reach through bank accounts and device, smart devices or just digital devices. Do you see yourself or your business now going down to the microfinance to help the the rural consumer or the urban consumer, which is focused on microfinance in any manner now? Is that an opportunity for you? So currently, Sunil, uh, we do about 30 million loans uh, a year. We add between two and a half and four and a half million Indians into the formal financial system every year. This is their first loan first time that they are entering a banking system, which otherwise meant that they went to the local money lender. Uh, it was four, four and a half million pre-COVID. COVID time, naturally, we also became a little bit more risk averse. So it's two and a half million now, and it's slowly expanding. So it's been about, say, 15, 17 million Indians in the last five years that have entered the formal financial system just with what Bajaj Finance does. Um, our focus has been around the middle class. Uh, where we believe the greatest need for uh, financial products and solutions exists. So that's, my, that's why my question, are you looking at, at a new audience for yourselves? Is that, is that a potential new avenue for you or, or is there enough room to continue to grow uh, in the middle India? We believe there is enough room, but we also believe that given uh, the, the size and capabilities that we have built, uh, we are now present in just Bajaj Finance. We are present in over 4,000 cities and towns around the country. And uh, for the first time, actually, earlier this year, the management presented its long-term strategy, five-year strategy to investors, because there was a lot of noise in the market about the stock and the performance of the company. And given the heightened exposure to any large company in India, we felt that rather than any information leak out, we are also, Bajaj Finance is nearly 45,000 people. We said, let's put it out. Of course, not in very high level of detail. We do plan in the next couple of years to get into the microfinance segment. We, earlier this year, earlier last year, expanded presence in two-wheelers. We are doing all branded two-wheelers now. By, in the next 12 months, we will enter the four-wheeler space, the new four-wheeler space as well. FI25, we will enter uh, the rural uh, tractor space, and at some point then uh, microfinance as well. So, because the business is so attractive, first, uh, you already had some of the largest groups in the business, and with the kind of growth it's showing, it is attracting more and more attention, including groups like Reliance now throwing their hat in the ring. What do you imagine will be the competitive landscape going forward in the short term to medium term future, uh, especially because many things have become easier now because of digital technologies. So a few large companies or groups that have significant access to customers because of existing businesses and Reliance clearly is one of them, um, have the advantage of a ready customer base. but. Building the right set of capabilities to manufacture financial products and sell them takes time. Uh, there isn't a technology system out there or a risk model that you can buy and implement. So a lot of it is actually learning, experiential learning, which will take time. Um, but just look at Bajaj Finance. With the kind of growth, uh, we are now just under 2.5 lakh crore AUM. 
we are less than 2% of the banking sector. So I think the opportunity is tremendous. Yes, probably the top 50 cities, the top 100 cities will see some intense competition in the next 24 months as some of these large players get started. But uh, the opportunity is beyond that and the opportunity is there to stay. So if I look at e-commerce, which is also like your services, e-commerce is another growth area right now. Uh, but a large chunk of the e-commerce business, I'm told as much as 60% is divided just between large companies like Amazon, Flipkart, etc. And now with ONDC platform coming in, is that a threat for you? Are, are they taking business away from you or are they creating a new opportunity for you? See, fortunately for us, we are an enabler. So we are present in physical stores, we are present in 150,000 uh, stores around the country, whether you're buying a mobile phone or a television a refrigerator, or you're buying a shoe or groceries or uh, fitness equipment. We are present online with all the large platforms, whether it's Reliance, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Flipkart, because we end up being an enabler, whether it is to give loans, payments, we've rolled out our payment offerings. Our payment offering, for example, is not just on the UPI platform. It's UPI, it's got all the bill payments, it's got the digital wallet, um, it's got our own digital store card, uh, what we call as the EMI card. We have 35 million digital uh, store cards now, and it has our digital credit card. So uh, it's an intelligent payment uh, platform that we have put in place. You can get insurance, and the intelligence that we are trying to build through our app, which is also what we link with all these other platforms is if you're going to go and buy uh, a refrigerator or a television, can I prompt you to where the best deal is on which of my financial products so that uh, you start using payments more intelligently. We will get there over a period of time as well. So we end up being, we end up complementing the real world. And to that extent, uh, fortunately, we don't face their competition head on. So you also said this, actually, I, I saw a statement by you where you said the financial services should grow two to three times the growth expected in the real economy to, to supplement the point you're making right now. Uh, how much of a resistance do you think there would be to this growth with the continuous high inflation, which seems to be sticky for now, uh, and pretty high interest rates, especially compared to where we would like to see real interest rates? Uh, do you see this easing off? Do you see this as a continued pushback for a while to the growth that you would like to see? So, so I would say there are two separate issues that I would like to uh, address over here. One, I'm not an economist, so there is this debate on the balance between growth, interest rates, and inflation. Part of our inflation we know is imported because of oil. Now, okay, because of Russia, we have some uh, relief over there. But there are political pressures that are going to come from the West. And that creates, as we all know, uh, Sunil and so many of you all over here, that creates continued uncertainty going forward on inflation and interest rates. Uh, we are pleased that RBI paused it this time. But very correctly, what they've said is we will see what's happening on the ground. The pause does not mean a change in direction. We'll have to address issues as they happen. Uh, as we see them, because this balance of growth and uh, uh, inflation is very real in this uncertain world. In the last 70 years, we've not seen a protracted period of time where there are so many global headwinds that are uh, that's creating significant amount of uncertainty. So what's the right number? I think this is something that experts, including RBI, can address. I think there is a second issue over here. When we see India growing right now at 6, 6.5%, um, this is despite those global headwinds. Otherwise, we should be growing at 7.5%, 8%. And 6, 6.5% growth of the economy does require the financial services sector to grow 2, 2.5 times to support that growth. And that's why you're seeing uh, non-food credit now at 17, 18% already. Uh, which shows that we are in a fortunate space where we have a very significant domestic market for consumption. And that's driving a lot of this growth. We can see the government is playing a significant role the last few years with public infrastructure investment. That has a multiplier effect on jobs, on consumption as well. So a combination of this is what is taking us ahead. The last point that I'd like us to leave 
uh, or that I thought I'd like to leave with you over here is most of our growth is funded currently by foreign capital. And it's great, you create the right channels for it, we do need foreign capital. But we also have to make sure that we are building long-term sources of domestic capital. And that is something that government and industry needs to get together to do because we can't long-term be reliant on foreign capital. Today we are an attractive destination, tomorrow we may not be. Let me try and bring the audience into the conversation. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would, would like to, to ask a question? Can we get a mic here, please? Yep. Is there only one mic here? Can we get two people with mics, please? We'll just be more efficient. One Mr. Jalan and one here, the gentleman who's standing here. Go, go ahead, please. I don't think he has a mic right now. Hmm. Sanjeev, you have been creatively ahead of your competition all the time. But times are changing and as Sunil said, reliance is coming in. Now, imitation is the best form of flattery. So you should be pleased with that. But how do you see this competition and how do you expect to remain ahead of the others? You know, 2007, Bajaj Finance had a uh, AUM of about 1500 crore. We made 20 crores of profit after tax that year. We were ahead of no one. The only thing that we were focused on was how could we make life better for our customers, uh, for them to choose us for a loan instead of going to some of the other large NBFCs or banks. Because we knew that we could not be the cheapest. We were firstly very small. We were competing with very large uh, other entities and pricing is a game that anybody else can beat you with because you just reduce your own uh, interest rates. So we built a set of capabilities for making it easier for customers to take loans, for making it more intuitive. Today on our digital platform, we uh, by end of the year, we will have 50 million uh, customers actively uh, buying stuff on the platform from buying products, as I said, mobile phones, televisions, cars, uh, two-wheelers. Of course, cars, two-wheelers is a lead that goes eventually to the showroom. But uh, taking personal loans, loans for their houses, buying insurance products, um, investments, making investments. Now, at the back of this is a data engine and a set of algorithms that build risk scorecards on every one of the 61 million customers that Bajaj Finance has and that pre-approve loans for them so that when they want to go and buy something, if they open up the app, they know that there's a loan available. So interruption, yeah. what is the quickest time in which you're able to assess uh, the risk attached, approve or, or, or reject an application for a loan? 30 seconds. 30 Fantastic. seconds, yeah. we would probably work with about 400 different variables on the customer to be able to produce that output. Uh, Sanjay has made a comment, but I think it's a question. He's asking, he's saying for consumer durables, you give us interest-free installments, also cash back, you pay interest and on deposits, yet you are highly profitable. Where's the magic sauce in here? That's the secret sauce. Now, I can't give you all my secrets over here. <laughs> but uh, no, no, it's actually simpler than that. Um, when we started off uh, doing consumer durable financing, this was, well, we started off 2000, 2001, but really 2007, 8 when we uh, rebuilt our plans. Um, at that time, what we realized was that uh, consumer durable cost 20, 30,000 rupees, you know, at that time for a 32 inch plasma TV. So it was not very expensive. And uh, we went to the large manufacturers, the Sony, Samsung, LGs of the world, and we told them that, you know, you guys spend so much money in marketing. But uh, as one of these gurus has said, you don't know which 50% of it is wisely spent and which is wasted. So we said, instead of that, we'll give a loan for 12 months, 18 months. It doesn't have to be longer than that because it's a two, 3,000 rupee monthly payment. Why don't you bear the interest costs? You see, if the interest is 17, 18, 19% on a reducing value loan, it's typically a four to 6% discount, which is a very small discount for these manufacturers. 
we were fortunate to break into Samsung. Because Samsung, if you remember, uh, were the main sponsors for the LA Olympics. That's when they really got onto the national, international scene. In India, they were still lagging. And they decided to do this to become number one in India. And then in a few years, they became number one. Once we cracked one, in a few months, we cracked the next. And we made that 0% interest truly a unique product for the customer. Where other than processing fees of 250 rupees one time, the customer pays nothing, is just equally divided. And it's a win-win because within a year, year and a half, we were able to show to the manufacturers that 40% of our consumers traded one product up. So if they came to buy a 32-inch plasma TV, they took a 40-inch TV. If they came to buy a single-door refrigerator, 40% took a double-door refrigerator because he or she could stretch his rupee more. The retailer was thrilled because they sold a more expensive product, got a higher commission. Manufacturer was still thrilled because he sold a more expensive product and we were thrilled. So it truly became a win-win, uh, uh, I would say, product idea. So Sanjeev, I can see some more slips have been sent, but we need to wind uh, 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 to wrap up the session. We, we are running a little bit behind time. So uh, do you have another? All right, we'll make this last one. Too much of telecalling from your call centers for taking loans. Any respite? Very, very sorry to hear that. Any answer that I give can be held against me. <laughs> the, the reality is that uh, over 80% of our engagement with customers is digital, is not through telecalling. We are hoping over the next 12 months it can be 100%. The telecalling, yes, there are. So, so we do uh, 100,000 loans a day. Um, we get complaints about five or six a day. Uh, of which this telecalling is probably maybe one or two. Now, we want it to be zero because nobody likes that. I get calls at times as well. So, um, the, the challenge is twofold. Wherever it's a miscreant in our system, we investigate because every call made is recorded by us. We have a centralized system that records every call, including every collection call, which is, can be a lot more distressing than just a promotional call. And we take action, including sacking the person if we find that the person has done it uh, wrong. Uh, but on the other hand, there are multiple fraudsters. Organized fraud is nearly 10 to 12 percent of this industry. We have busted call centers with 200, 300 people running, working in those call centers. And they pretend to be Bajaj, they pretend to be SBI, they pretend to be somebody else. Right now, we are the punching boys I can see in the last six, eight weeks, even in social media. Our own job is how do we get better and better and uh, make sure that the 100,000 customers every day who need their loan, we can still be available to them, but not be a pest to the rest. We are also working with different agencies, including intelligence agencies, to um, try and get these fraudsters at bay. And we are also working on uh, further adding to our technology capacity so that we can, from our side at least, try and take telecalling to zero. So then if somebody is getting a call, we'll say, go and complain to the police because we can 100% tell you it's not us. Today I can tell you 97% it's not us, but I cannot tell you 100%. So Sanjeev, this is a conversation which we could go on for a, for a while uh, and you have a wealth of knowledge, information and a rich experience to share. So thank you very much for coming in for this conversation and thank you for the audience for being part of the conversation. Thank you. And thank you for doing this. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful session. May I now request Mr. Srinivas Dempo, President Aima, to please join us on stage to present mementos to our guests, Mr. Sanjeev Bajaj and Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal. Thank you, Mr. Dempo, for joining us on stage to do the honors. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we are immediately starting with the last session of the Conclave shortly.